Last night you drew three types of natural selection on a bell curve, directional, stabilizing, and disruptive. Uh, remember that disruptive is the one that if it continues dramatically enough, a population can split into and undergo what we call speciation where they become different enough that they can't interbreed any longer. That is called reproductive isolation. So along with your three types of selection, we also talked about three types of reproductive isolation, which are geographic, where they're physically separated and can't get to each other. Behavioral, which is where a behavior has changed enough that they will no longer mate, they're not willing to. And temporal, where it's a matter of timing. They're not out at the same time. Their mating seasons are different. The female's not fertile at the right time. Whatever it is, it's timing. That's what temporal means. So with those in mind, let's talk about a speciation model, which is sort of an example. Uh, one of the easiest animals to, to, to think about and take data on and, and has had data taken on it is birds, and in particular, the finches in the Galapagos Islands off the coast of Ecuador have gotten a lot of study for this stuff. So this is just kind of a, a hypothetical. Here's how the Galapagos finches probably went from one ancestor species to 13 different species across those islands. They all have the same common ancestor. The question is, how did they become those 13 different species? So here's a model of that. Number one. Ah. Now, that's a way better South American than that is Galapagos Islands. But here's what happens the founder species, the species from the mainland, is flying over the ocean, just a quick trip for lunch or whatever, gets blown off course and they wind up on the first island, okay? And that's, let's call that population A. Now, at some point, some of those birds wind up heading over to another island and they stay there, they don't come back. Um, you know, a few mating pairs wind up on the second island and now we've got birds on two different islands. Um, okay. On island B, it turns out, um, there's a bunch of seeds on island B that are too big for about half the birds to crack open. Those birds die. The birds that survive are the ones who genetically have bigger, stronger beaks. And so population B, A remains the same beak-wise, but B gets bigger and bigger beaks, yeah? So let's call that natural selection on population B. And this is where it gets fun. Because now we have a population B that has bigger beaks than population A. Like I said, birds are picky. They're not gonna have chicks with just anybody. It needs to be exactly the right bird. Dance has to be perfect or song has to be perfect. In this case, in this case, beak has to be right. Beak has to be right. Yeah, it can't be a big chunky beak for these eight birds. So when B birds fly back to, to Island A, now we got some A's and some B's there. They won't touch each other. They're not, they're not gonna interbreed. They prefer their own type of beak. And so we call that reproductive isolation. Specifically, which one is that one? They don't want to. Good, that's behavioral, yeah. Don't want to, as opposed to can't. Can't was 
them being on different islands. But when they made it back, now it's behavioral. They're too different. So now their relationship has changed. The A's and the B's hanging out on the first island there. What is true about their relationship now? They're not interbreeding anymore. What are they doing? Okay, what's their relationship on that island? Do you think they probably mostly eat the same stuff? Do you think they're probably out about the same time of day? Yeah, their niches have, have should be mostly overlapping except for the beak thing. They are direct competitors. And that competition is also gonna drive natural selection. So that's ecological competition. And we're gonna say this one, the big, big birds are way better at getting food than the little big birds. B starts winning. No, I take that back. That's not what this says. The little beak birds are better because the seeds are little on that island and it's hard to pick them up with a big clumsy beak like that. Um, so A birds are doing way better and the B birds are starting to die out except that some of the B birds are a little more flexible genetically and they're able to forage for their food later and later during the day. And eventually they evolve to where they're mostly out at night. And so at this point, that eliminates some of the competition with A. And that B bird has become a C. Because if they're only out at night, even if they go back to the second island, they're not going to be able to mate with the bees because they're out at different times. That's temporal isolation. Anyway, regardless of the mechanism, that's what the model of speciation kind of looks like. It's like separation, geographic separation, separate evolution. They become different enough that even when they come back, all that does is create competition because they want to breed. And you get this kind of pressure cooker of, holy cow, it's, it's, it's easy to get a lot of species in just a few million years. Is it just with this example, or is it with most examples that the two types are first separated geographically, or is that just? We think that that's a pretty common model, but of course, more common on islands with things like birds or things that can swim, because it's so easy to sort of get you know stuck on stuck in different places. But you know, if you think of continents as giant islands, it's pretty easy to widen the the, the example. So that's sort of just like a, uh, here's what it might look like, one species branching into a bunch of species. Questions? Cool, we're getting close to the end here. Uh, by the way, we are looking at a test. I haven't decided Thursday or Friday yet. I think probably Friday. I'll tell you by the end of the period, see how far we go. Heck, let's do Monday after break. <laughs> That'd be a disaster. It really would. I mean, Tuesday. <laughs> I promise it would be a disaster. Um, all right. Hardy Weinberg. Named after two, two evolutionary biologists named Hardy and Weinberg. I don't know their first names. Basically, what they did was they started using math and genetics together to measure evolution. You're not going to have to do any of the math. You're just going to have to know the conditions that they sort of figured out mathematically. Um, we call it Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and by equilibrium we mean no change, no evolution. What they basically said is, hey, every population we see is evolving. What would it take for them not to? Perfect. And the reason, no, perfect, perfect doesn't really enter into it because there's these, these those mutations, you know, mutations are always going to happen. So, absolutely, it is. Um, 
And so what they said was, all right, in order to understand why this is happening in every population, we need to cook it down to, okay, what would we have to take away from those populations for them not to change? And so that's, that's what this is. This is the five things you're gonna have to learn that upset equilibrium, the five things that cause evolution. Not all of them are true of every population, but it's a good way, you know, figuring these five things out was a good way to figure out the different pressures on different populations. So five things that cause evolution that you would have to take away to create equilibrium. Number one, non-random mating pressures. As soon as there is any kind of mate preference, Female birds preferring bright colors in male feathers, for example, is a non-random mating preference that's very common. As soon as those are there, it sets into motion something called sexual selection that drives evolution pretty hard. Like hard enough that you get ridiculous things like the peacock's tail. That's a product of sexual selection. Big, long, ridiculous tail that can't possibly be adapted. Well, sexual selection. Um, small populations evolve faster than big ones. The phenomenon called genetic drift, where if there aren't very many individuals in the population, just them being born and dying in that population is going to change the gene pool significantly. Third is individuals moving in and out of the population, right? That changes the gene pool. That counts as evolution. Can't have that if you're not going to change. Number four is mutations. And here we get down to the ones that are pretty much true of all populations. All living things we know are built on DNA, and DNA accumulates mutations. That's just something that happens. That's going to cause evolution even more strongly if you have those mutations if you have genetic differences natural selection kind of kicks in and that's a fact right that's a strong mechanism of evolution so a hardy weinberg equilibrium would be some it would be a population that didn't have any of those things as far as we know it doesn't exist but the use of this for them for, for scientists that study this stuff is you can basically set up an equation that has all these factors in it. And depending on which of the five factors are happening most strongly, you can kind of predict how a population is going to change. Again, you don't have to learn the equation. You don't have to learn any of the math. You just got to know those five things that are basically the main drivers of the genetic change that is evolution. Can I give you sample essays, even though we're not quite done with the chapter? Have you worked? When will it be due? Um, it'll, it'll be due Thursday. So then we can take our test Friday. Yeah. And then we'll finish the last bit of the chapter tomorrow. We'll watch movies. Oh. <laughs> I have two, we'll see. We may have time for both. We may just have time for one. Um, and then we'll take our test Friday, unless I find out there's something weird going on on Friday, in which case we'll have to push it to Thursday. But I don't think they have anything.